Uh, this is Meera Hamid. Um, I will be talking about Ewing sarcoma for this lecture. My lecture will include a case presentation, differential diagnosis, ancillary techniques, immunohistochemistry, molecular diagnosis and caveats, and I will briefly discuss uh, Ewing-like sarcomas in the end. So to start with, this is a 14-year-old male who presented with forearm pain. A plain radiograph shows a permeative lesion at the radial diaphysis, which is associated with a prominent periosteal reaction as shown by the green arrows. This periosteal reaction is interrupted and not continuous and has the appearance of onion skin. You can appreciate also cortical thickening and within the marrow, <coughs> the lesion is lytic poorly marginated with a permeative pattern that is without a beginning and or an end. Coronal and axial MRT2 with fat suppression shows a marrow occupying tumor sh showing bright T2 signal with cortical destruction and extra osseous extension surrounding the cortex. The radiological differential diagnosis <coughs> is based upon the patient's age who is young and adolescent location of the lesion diaphysis, diaphysis with interrupted periosteal reaction, soft tissue extension and which is all small blue ground cell tumors which is, and Langerhans histiocytosis and osteomyelitis. So a biopsy was performed and this is the low power view of the biopsy showing a cellular neoplasm composed of monotonous population of cells in a sheet like growth pattern. Here is a medium power view which shows a diffuse proliferation of small round blue cells. The nuclei are round with fine chromatin, scant clear or eosinophilic cytoplasm, indistinct cellular membranes. There are dark and light cells in this photomicrograph giving it a biphasic appearance. The dark cells are cells undergoing apoptosis giving it a darker appearance to their nuclei. Another medium power view shows clusters of cells surrounding a central pink material forming rosette-like structures. Histologically, um, the tumor is readily identifiable as a small round blue cell tumor. So at this point, we have to think about pathological differential diagnosis, Ewing sarcoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, small cell osteosarcoma, neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, desmoplastic small round cell tumor, and mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. I will touch upon the Ewing-like sarcomas later. How do we approach such a tumor in pathological diagnosis? So there's histology and histological subtype, which is aided by performing immunohistochemical stains, and in in many cases, we have to do molecular diagnosis to arrive at the right diagnosis. Immunohistochemical markers can be used to differentiate the various small round cell tumors. This is a panel which is a, uh, commonly used um, as immunohistochemical stains to differentiate the, these neoplasms. CD99 is a marker used for Ewing sarcoma, but it is not a specific marker. Desmin and myogenin is used for rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, FLY1 is used for Ewing sarcoma, but it is not, again, a specific marker. L LCA is leukocyte common antigen. TDT is terminal deoxynucleotidyl transferase. And B and T cells are B and T cell markers. These three markers are used to differentiate lymphomas. WT1 is a marker for desmoplastic small round cell tumor. Um, cytokeratin will stay in endocrine carcinomas, but again, it is not specific. Chromogranin is used for neuroblastoma, and it is not specific marker. It can stain Ewing sarcoma, and S100 can stain mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. It is again not a specific marker. So this immunohistochemical profile here is shown in the table format. Uh, the staining patterns of Ewing sarcoma and its mimics are shown. 
The important point to remember is CD99 is not specific. As you can see, it can stain many other uh, small rounds of tumors. And one caveat is lymphoblastic lymphoma. It can be negative for leukocyte common antigen, BNT cell marker. It is very important to do a TDT to differentiate lymphoblastic lymphoma from Ewing sarcoma. When CD99 is used in Ewing sarcoma, the staining pattern is diffuse and membranous as seen in this photomicrograph. This is a FLY1 positive Ewing sarcoma. Again, you can see a diffuse but nuclear pattern of staining. And as I said earlier, FLY1 is a non-specific marker for Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma can be diagnosed by karyotyping um, of uh, and showing the translocation, which is diagnostic. This slide shows the most common translocation seen in more than 90% of Ewing sarcoma, the T1122, involving the EWSR1 gene at chromosome 22 and PLY1 gene at chromosome 11. However, karyotyping is not always available and practical, and most labs perform fluorescent in situ hybridization as diagnostic assay. This slide shows the two different fish technologies commonly used to detect chromosomal translocations. The fusion assay uses two gene probes of known translocation to detect the fusion assay. The gene 1A probe and the gene 1B probe shows a fusion signal which is yellow, whereas the splitting assay uses two probes from one of the genes and look for a break caused by translocation of the gene as seen as one green and one red signal and one normal yellow signal representing the intact gene and this is otherwise called the break apart probe. So this slide demonstrates advantages of fish that one must remember and pay attention during interpretation. Fish can be used in fresh, frozen or paraffin tissue. It can be used in interface or metaphase cells. There is a rapid turnaround time of one to three days. It can detect translocations which are not detectable on karyotype and it's very sensitive and specific. What are the disadvantages of fluorescent in situ hybridization or limitations? It is a more targeted approach and not a screening tool. We have only limited number of probes available. The fluorescent microscopy has a uh, inherent signal fading. Over time, the signal will fade. When you use paraffin tissue, uh, there can be nuclear truncation. So you have to be very careful with your interpretation of the signals. This is an example of a case using a commercially available EWS or one break apart probe. The green and red signals are separate confirming that EWSR1 is rearranged. One has to remember this does not give you information on the partner gene of the translocation. Another approach is reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction analysis. In this technique, RNA is extracted from tumor sample and is converted into cDNA and gene-specific primers are used to detect the translocation. In this technology, both partners are detected. How I will discuss the caveats in the next few slides. This slide demonstrates the various translocation partners for, U, for EWS or one in Ewing sarcoma. Please also notice in certain cases, the first gene can be an alternate gene in Ewing sarcoma. This slide demonstrates various breakpoints and exons involved in only the EWSR1 FLY1 fusion. There are at least 18 in frame fusion types which have been described for this EWSR1 FLY1 fusion alone. Additionally, EWSR1 belongs to the family of interconnected network of fusions it turns out to be a very promiscuous gene as shown in this diagram. 
This slide shows tumor types with EWS or one rearrangement, which is a growing list of tumors where EWS or one is uh, rearranged. So one has to be very cautious in interpretation of EWS or one gene rearrangement in a tumor, and it ha and it has to be done in the context of clinical imaging morphology and immunohistochemical findings. And one must also remember that FUS can be an alternate gene for Ewing sarcoma. Next is a brief discussion of recently discovered Ewing sarcoma-like tumors. Two of them are listed here. One is a chick ducks 4 rearranged pediatric round cell sarcomas. And the other tumor is B core CCNB3 rearranged round cell sarcoma. This is the largest series of chick ducks 4 rearranged uh, round cell sarcoma, and it's summarized in this slide. This group of tumors are under WHO grouped as undifferentiated round cell sarcoma. There are 115 cases reported mean age 32 years, most commonly in soft tissue, very rarely in bone. The histology can be quite variable. They can be round to oval epithelioid or spindle. The staining pattern of CD99 is quite variable in these tumors. It can be very diffuse in 23%. Over 90% of these tumors will stain for WT1 and their five-year survival is poor, about 43%. This is the histology and morphological spectrum. And as you can see, the tumors have a round spindle morphology, have a starry sky pattern, and they are, can be strongly positive for WT1. Compared to Ewing sarcoma, these tumors have a poor survival. This is the second uh, group of Ewing-like sarcoma. Here is an example of a 15-year-old female with proximal female lesion, a lytic bone lesion, which shows a small round blue cell tumor morphology with a salt and pepper chromatin pattern. The cells are uh, larger than a classical Ewing sarcoma. Immunohistochemical analysis shows a CD99 somewhat diffuse positivity. This tumor stains for the p core antibody, very strong and diffuse, nuclear staining pattern. They can be focally positive for uh, epithelial membrane antigen. And the p core fish analysis shows a positive breakout signal with separate green and red signals as shown in the uh, photomicrograph. This tumor was originally discovered by RNA sequencing as a BCOR CCNB3 rearranged tumor, as demonstrated in this slide. Um, by this rearrangement, the BCOR is uh, rearranged in front of the CCNB3 gene, which leads to an increased expression of the CCNB3 uh, in these tumors. So this is a summary of, again, a largest series of the BCOR CCNB3 fusion-positive sarcomas. 36 cases with a median age of 15, male predominance. These are more common in bone uh, than soft tissue. The morphology overlaps with other BCOR fusion tumors. And BCOR immunohistochemical stain is highly sensitive, but it is not a specific stain for this group of tumors. And their five-year survival is better than chick ducks for rearranged sarcomas. It's about 72%. So it's important to make this distinction between PCOR CCNB3 rearranged sarcoma, chick ducks for sarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma. This table um, shows the various genetic abnormalities seen in undifferentiated round cell sarcoma. So in chick ducks for group of tumors, you can have a, a, a another partner, chick foxo 4 In the PCAR rearranged tumors, there are PCAR CCNB3, B 
car manual 3 zc 3 h 7 b p car y w h a e nothing b 2 b p car internal tandem duplication uh, and there are other tumors such as clear cell sarcoma of the kidney which can have the similar rearrangement as b car itd and y w h a e nothing b 2 b or e and endometrial stromal sarcomas and ossifying fibromyxoid tumors can have zc 3 h 7 bp core so there is a an overlap between the uh, the gene arrangements of undifferenti undifferentiated round cell sarcoma and other tumors such as clear cell sarcoma and endometrial sarcoma and ossifying fibro tumors in summary Ewing sarcoma is the second most common pediatric malignancy in the skeletal system um, of children and adolescents. Ewing sarcoma can also occur in soft tissue. It's an extremely rare tumor in African American children. Virtually any bone can be affected. Femur is the most common location in long bones. Clinically, this tumor can mimic osteomyelitis. Morphology is a typical small round cell tumor. However, there can be atypical presentations such as large cell and aromatinoma like Ewing sarcoma. It, this tumor is defined by the EWS R1 rearrangement with specific partners. And there are morphological limit, mimics of these tumor, which is undifferentiated round cell sarcomas with various other translocations involving the chick gene and the PCOR gene. And they have different tumor, clinical behavior and treatment responses. Um, thank you very much.